Uh, greetings to today's teleclass audience. We're very proud to have you uh, with us today. Uh, our speaker today is well known to the Weber teleclass uh, series for many years. He is Andrew Streifel, um, recently retired from the University of Minnesota, but by no means uh, just taking it easy. He is a good friend and a colleague to me and many others. Uh, he remains in demand as a world-class consultant on environmental pre infection prevention issues, including indoor air quality, water management, and the built environment in both design and construction concerns. As Paul has just said, his topic today is Infection Control Risk Assessment, or ICRA as we know it by its acronym, the issues of new construction. So please welcome Andrew Streifel. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Thank you for your kind words. It's uh, always a pleasure to uh, reach an audience uh, out and about uh, while I'm sitting here in my living room. So uh, it is a pleasure, and I've had the distinct uh, privilege and uh, very grateful privilege of, of assisting many, many hospitals worldwide in construction and management as well as uh, epidemiological uh, analysis of, of infections from uh, fungal disease to uh, water quality. So, I mean, it's environmental infection control, and Lynn has been very instrumental in, in, in developing that through the Centers for Disease Control, her former employee. So, uh, let's get started. Uh, uh, really, on the, on the next slide, too, uh, we see the real reason why we have issues, and that is it's all about the patient. The patient uh, is, unfortunately, the problem, but uh, the problem is one of benevolence, uh, that we have as humans to try and take care of those who are really sick and unfortunately for them they become very susceptible so uh, in order to deal with this our standards have started to change and uh, we just don't think of a construction project in the hospital as being a warehouse or uh, something other than a high risk uh, area or risk to the individual's occupants in that space so uh, slide three, with new construction, uh, um, we have just some topics I jotted down. My goodness, to go on and on and, and deal with the true agent of a hospital, which is the architect. Uh, they do most of the planning, and now in new construction, that may be uh, many hundreds of square cubic or square meters of of, of space, uh, thousands of square meters of space. I believe our hospital is about eighty thousand square meters. The one that I retired from it. Uh, these topics, uh, hand cleansing, ventilation, pressure management, uh, bathrooms, a number of sinks, water quality, utility rooms, construction quality, best practice, and on and on are, are just some of the topics that need to be dealt with. And when it comes to something like energy and water conservation, well, that truly impacts what, what goes on, not only with our ventilation systems, but also with our water usage. And some of the uh, the, the efforts that we make to conserve water uh, are really stagnating the water, which allows those 20-minute uh, uh, double times that gram negatives have and ideal conditions to really uh, grow and surge, if you will. And that brings up surge pass capacity. Surge capacity, pre preparation for some kind of unknown event <clears throat> to come upon us uh, um, it has, as in every hospital's readiness package be it a bridge falling in my city and sending 40 patients to my hospital, or, or be it the pandemic uh, from some kind of infectious disease that lands on our shores, regardless where we are in the world. So uh, we need to think about how we prepare for that in design. We need to think about how we're going to re react to water damage uh, and uh, uh, other interesting as aspects like tie-ins and outages. Our utility outages can create problems. So again, next slide, what you look at, uh, what and where risk during uh, construction, uh, uh, the air and water aspects, we just still have to uh, really look at the susceptible patient. Uh, some people tell me that every patient uh, coming into a hospital is immune suppressed or immune compromised in some way. I can believe that, uh, um, but yet it is our high-end hospitals where we do uh, um, interesting surgeries, uh, radiation therapy, uh, modern catheterization methods, and then keeping all that equipment clean are all challenges in, in developing a, a tertiary care facility. 
Uh, procedures, bedside, or other areas are, are really a factor. Having my mother be in the hospital uh, for uh, some medical treatment here in the last few months, it, uh, it, it really surprised me to see very little ownership by any one physician except her primary, and unfortunately her primary doesn't take care of her while she's in the hospital. So uh, very interesting aspects of, of, of infection prevention. Uh, in, in the modern uh, patient care environment. So we need to think about that and how we deal with uh, environmental infection control with the utilities, uh, um, uh, outages, and how to deal with them from ventilation management during projects, especially as we tie into uh, an existing building. And, oh, my gosh, I could get into water quality, but that's not going to be a topic today, uh, but one of, of, of a very uh, much of interest in, in today's uh, construction world. The fifth slide really goes to what we have to do, and that is design according to code. In the United States, we have Uniform Building Code, we have National Fire Protection, the IBC, International Building Code, is becoming more prominent along with plumbing, electrical, mechanical, and pharmacy. Uh, and uh, while it's not actually a code, but a best practice and the standard of care facilities guidelines, uh, guidelines for construction and design and construction of hospitals, as well as for what Lynn has written as Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and, uh, and, and become standards of care. And uh, please, folks, realize that in the United States, uh, we have uh, uh, issues uh, of a government, uh, government regulation, but it's the lawyers who change things. Uh, unfortunately, lawsuits occur, and if they find uh, negligence uh, in development of these codes or the building practice, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, standards that uh, must be followed in order to receive uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services reimbursements, and that's a big deal because it amounts to a huge percentage of, of revenue for most uh, large hospitals, most hospitals uh, uh, around the United States. Uh, fortunately, the Association for Practitioners of Infection Control on slide six uh, created an infection um, prevention manual for construction and renovation, and it's the policies and the documents and uh, the various topics in this book that really help uh, infection control practitioners uh, put together uh, a plan. And uh, what we were given the privilege in being co-authors of, of this particular book uh, we were able in slide seven to give examples of policies for construction and renovation. Uh, this is really uh, the, the C-suite. The C-suite uh, a lot of times can be a problem in any construction project, especially if you've got a good old boys network, and I have seen it, uh, uh, where the CEO has a handshake and we'll do what we need to do to get the job done. And boy, I wish I could tell those stories. Uh, uh, where they neglected uh, some of the basics, the principles of infection prevention. And then you see here in the policies one through six, a variety of uh, uh, concepts associated with infection control risk assessment and, and uh, what it means that, uh, to, to be part of uh, the construction. It's, it's verbiage. Uh, it's something that people tend not to want to read, but in the next slide, it starts giving us definitions uh, um, where we need to be involved. Uh, and uh, the risk assessment is a tool uh, to really uh, stratify infection control risks. Uh, and it's really important uh, to really anticipate the list, the, the risks. Uh, and in a brand new building, not being occupied, not being tied in, uh, um, there are a lot of things in place that, that are, are uh, things that we can take more time with. Uh, and that's uh, the ICRA based on, on the Facilities Guidelines Institute, the timing, the team, the design, how to deal with surfaces, a very important infection prevention uh, consideration, as well as how we do construction compliance, uh, mitigation response. What do you do when the water comes in and you start flooding? Do you, how do you prevent it? How do you react to it? Uh, how is communication uh, sent around uh, the building uh, if, in fact, there is a problem? Uh, and it's emergency responses that, that really are a very major, major a part of it. And if we didn't have good project management, uh, again, I'm not going to read through all of these points, but you have them. You can look at them uh, as an example. And, of course, you can refer to the book. And what I'm doing is taking out of the book what we have done here at the University of Minnesota 
uh, and put into print, which uh, they were gracious enough to give permission so it can be published, and that's what you're looking at in slide eight. So it's, again, the code requirements are very important, and during construction, things like interim life safety, which I discussed in renovation uh, and the coordination of, of the of the fire watches and infection control elements in construction uh, are, are very nice to coordinate. Uh, the and ninth slide really gives the power in our master specification to to uh, require the contractor to do certain things uh, to follow certain to certain aspects of their job, and there is a place there for infection prevention, and it is a segment of our uh, um, master specifications. How many institutions have this? Uh, I don't know, but if it's uh, if it's written down like this, it gives the contractor something that he has to bid on uh, uh, and realize that he's responsible for, unless there's been a handshake, so saying that they can ignore it, but I hope that doesn't happen too often, even though I know it happens. So uh, it's really important to recognize that these master specs can be a very good use especially in the, uh, the training and the, the building and the uh, commissioning. And uh, we here in a moment or two, we'll talk about exterior work and a number of other things that are, that are important. And unfortunately, I can't cover it all. This is just a, a smattering of, of what it takes. So slide 10 uh, is uh, the latest job uh, that of, of a hospital on my campus where we tied two buildings, a green field, plus tying into an existing structure uh, for the University of Minnesota pediatric facility uh, at, uh, that we opened in, in 2015 and uh, one that uh, in, the, in slide 11 uh, has uh, a construction worker hospital training program and, and really that's something we do for all contractors that come on site. Every Monday morning there's a training session. Uh, you can't cover uh, as you're finding out in one hour what needs to be done. And this index on slide 11 is, is really uh, the, the explanation up through 10 uh, of, of what they need to know while in, in the hospital. And really the uh, uh, infection control risk aspect of that is just one very small, one very small consideration. So uh, we, really need, we really need to consider a lot of things uh, especially if it comes to uh, construction management in healthcare. On slide 12, we, in, in the document, we've taken uh, the risk assessment we did for our hospital, and uh, um, this is really a listing of a number of things that have to do with design. Uh, it has to do with whether or not everybody agrees yes or no. It's a sort of the old soaping concept of, of nursing where we uh, put responsibility, responses and notes in the right-hand column as to whether or not it's the facilities management service uh, or if it, in fact, is, uh, is the uh, architect who is in charge of that concept. And it's generally just those two people, uh, the construction workers uh, and, and uh, the uh, architects, really put together a awful lot of the things that are required and the contractor builds them. It's things like which way does the air move uh, in isolation rooms, be it uh, the negative pressure airborne infection isolation or the protective environments for operating rooms and bone marrow transplant rooms. Uh, it, it gives uh, um, some concept of, of sinks. You see special order sinks there where we don't get splashing in the drain when the spigot from the um, from the devices is uh, uh, running water in that in that sink. So we have offsets on some of our buildings uh, because of special order sinks. Turns out about the same price, but it minimizes the splashing of various gram negative burkled area, sapatia or something like that, from the drain or pseudomonas and splashing. Uh, towards the patient. Of course, there are designs to keep them away, and we list that in in these uh, um, um, specifications that you say by see by the architect in the left hand column. The next slide starts to cover different aspects about the airborne infection isolation, bone marrow transplant, protective rooms, 
uh, what they need to do in, in those areas, uh, who's got responsibility. You'll see names in the document uh, of, of people who at this institution uh, were, were in, in, uh, involved with these kinds of things and where they take uh, responsibility. In addition, then you've got things like the filters. How are the filters put in place? If you have a bone marrow transplant unit or an operating room and you re well, request the premier uh, filter, the HEPA filter 9997 at 0.3, that is a place where you can start to request it. Uh, it also deals with emergency departments and the need potentially for surge. If you get uh, a, a whole variety of people showing up with measles, let's say, like happened in our city. I believe we had 20-some cases of needles, measles show up and we didn't have adequate uh, uh, isolation capability on some of the pediatric wards where they, they did show up in our city, not in our institution. It's also places where you can start talking about uh, your endoscope processing machines, your ventilation requirements in the operating rooms and what you should have. We'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, and in the means and methods second section on page 14, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, what kinds of construction uh, considerations are, are necessary and uh, um, uh, who gets the ICRA, who gets, understands what it means. And this is really important uh, because a lot of the rank and file could care less. They just want to uh, go to work and come home. So it's how do you reach those people? How do you reach the, the site management and, and managing break areas? Uh, one of the biggest disappointments I had in my career when we were building our 1987 hospital was the amount of food debris that we found in the walls. Uh, my goodness sakes, uh, uh, what are you guys thinking? I don't know, nobody's going to look back there, but it attracts vermin. It uh, helps establish a pathway for the mice to get in the building, and that's certainly something we've discovered. If I told you the number of hospitals or the quality of the hospitals, where I've seen this happen, it's really a big deal. So in the specifications, we write in, workers shall take breaks in designated areas. And as you can see, we've got garbage cans there. Uh, we've got a whole variety of, uh, of, of amenities, tables, and places to put backpacks so that uh, it's not vulnerable to theft. And, and, uh, and it keeps the food... Uh, out of the work area and, and puts the world food in, in places where it belongs. I've had hospitals call me and say, you know, we turned on the air handling system when we were getting ready to occupy and bones came out of the ductwork. Oh, oh my gosh. That's the value of protecting the ductwork and keeping the, the, the vermin out. Uh, uh, and the attraction with food is really a, the main way those people, those bugs and those uh, animals come to that, that space. So when you think about what we need to do, especially for ventilation, uh, we need to think about uh, um, what the, uh, what the uh, uh, specifications are. What kind of pressure relationships should we have? Uh, what kind of air changes per hour in the special ventilation rooms or the filtration efficacy either in the the, the positive pressure, the protective environments, or the negative pressure, the airborne infection isolation requirements where we want to contain the, the diseased individual. So again, we want to make sure we understand a very, very important principle, and that is clean to dirty airflow. What's clean and what's dirty? Uh, and we can enhance that flow as well as the cleansing action, the, the purging of the environment by Quite simply, uh, um, enhancing the air change rates. The solution to pollution is dilution, and it's diluted with highly filtered air. 90% efficient, 95%, and 99% are all extremely good filters if they're properly installed and maintained. And then when we have our, our pressure relationships, uh, the true aspect of infection control, uh, uh, the, the, the necessary movement that from clean patient to dirty environment, or dirty environment, in the case of somebody with tuberculosis or measles, uh, it stays in the room with the patient. So uh, understanding that is very important, and boy, I have seen mess-ups. I can't imagine it happening today. But still, vigilance, you never such a thing as a stupid question. It has to be asked, and then you have to show me 
uh, that it actually works the way they say it should work. So the next slide, 16, gets us into the materials uh, plan of management, the debris plan of management. As you can see on the right-hand side there, we have recycling. We have, instead of throwing that debris in through the walls so that uh, we're not lazy and, and don't want to take it out because that takes time and effort, the supervisor says, do it. No, 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 we can't do it. Uh, lead, fortunately, is is driving us to recycle, to, to take care of those um, building materials and not dispose of them in the building because all buildings leak and some of those cardboard and, and, and some of the uh, drywall, the gypsum board, all can contribute uh, to mold growth if they get wet and it will get wet. So the best thing is in all our interstitial space, we don't have stuff in there. Dust management is a big deal. Just debris management is a big deal. And that's one of the reasons why in big projects, we like to clean it up on Fridays. Friday afternoon, get equipped, uh, get all the excess debris out of there as much as we possibly can, make it look a, a, a lot better, which really helps in uh, track management, tractor management, and so on. You may be wondering on slide 16 what that big old thing there is that's hanging over the top. Uh, that actually was moving the air intake for our operating rooms uh, up and away from some hot work and from some uh, jackhammering and a number of other things that are below it. Uh, it got it away so that uh, the fumes and the dust wouldn't get into the, the fan system and create odor problems and that really can mess up surgery if the surgeon can't concentrate and we want them to concentrate uh, while doing some uh, delicate uh, surgery because it stinks, uh, smells like the back end of the uh, air compressor. <clears throat> so, I mean, we don't want that. Uh, uh, the outer wall, uh, how we deal with the outer wall, the building uh, uh, is, is very important because it has a lot to do with how we manage water coming through the facade. Uh, the next slide, 17, shows water damage because the rock has been, uh, the, the gypsum board has been kept off the slab. Uh, it does not suck up, wick up, if you will, the water into that paper bath uh, drywall, which uh, is an excellent uh, growth material for mold. And we don't want mold in our hospitals for a bunch of reasons. And in primary reason, perception, and the most critical reason is infection. Uh, uh, but uh, we don't want that to happen. Uh, or we certainly keep rock off the slab. Uh, some inch, uh, through five eighths of an inch, that says I think up to a half an inch. Uh, but uh, five eighths is what the master spec says. I don't know how that got changed. But uh, in addition, then value engineering is another aspect. You don't have enough money to complete the project, so what are we going to do? Are we going to just put a plastic on the walls uh, as a shield, or are we going to put good ceramic up uh, in, in the operating room? So, I mean, it's those kinds of decisions, and some of them, infection prevention, should really have a say uh, in value engineering because some of it will have a direct impact. So uh, I, I feel that that is a very important aspect of, of, of construction. Commissioning, uh, what did you get? Next slide. Uh, what, did you get what you paid for? Uh, um, if, you, <laughs> if you got what you paid for, you wouldn't be putting in this. And, and certainly what we have found in uh, meetings that don't go well uh, with uh, with vendors, contractors, is, is the simple fact that uh, uh, the specification was never specified, if you will. Uh, if you say you want uh, a 2.5 pascals or a hundredth of an inch pressure differential, uh, how do you know you got that? Who's going to tell you that? And that's what the, the, the performance-based uh, uh, um, specifications are really important. It's the building owner's requirement uh, that we have those and, uh, uh, and and certainly was part of the commissioning. And it makes sure that we have things like uh, hot water heaters working properly. It makes sure that's very important. I know a hospital where they moved in before the hot water heater wasn't working. They, they knew it wasn't working. It took them a week to get Legionella uh, out of court settlement. Can't talk about it other than. It happened, uh, and uh, uh, certainly things that we don't want as liability, and for that institution, they were large, they were self-insured, uh, so it came out of the, the institution's pocket. So 
Uh, we don't want that to happen uh, if we can avoid it. So making sure things work before we move in is, is, is a big part. And there are infection control aspects that should be validated, as you can see, with pressure testing as well as particle counting uh, in, in that slide. Now, 19, uh, slide 19 uh, uh, has some key components, exterior of the building, ventilation systems and water systems, all of which are are very important for, for sustainability of the building. Uh, uh, but we start with the exterior. In my climate, in North, uh, in North America, Northern, North Central, North America, um, United States, I should say, uh, the exterior testing is really for all of those items, waterproof, air infiltration, condensation, cooling, heat, and structural. Um, uh, we asked our uh, vendor to actually build a wall because it was uh, a fancy pants wall, according to the architects. So we had them build it, and then slide 21, we did dynamic testing. If you look closely, uh, there is a propeller there that will build some wind speed, uh, and there are nozzles on the crossbars in front of the windows on that building where the wind pressure can uh, match uh, hurricane force uh, or 12 pounds per square foot for 15 minutes to make sure that uh, we don't get leaking on on that facade. So it, it's an important aspect. We did that because of the type of hospital and the transplant programs that we do. Uh, and it's really important to know if it's going to leak. Likewise, in our climate in slide 22, we have thermal extremes. We went, uh, I think we were 35 below Fahrenheit uh, last year. And uh, this summer we only made it to 90, but that's, uh, 120 some degrees uh, uh, temperature differential, so it's uh, that that's an extreme for the coefficients of expansion and contraction that occur in metals and windows, window uh, glass, and we simulated those extremes uh, uh, as an, in an effort again to make sure we get the best wall. Now this is an extreme measure because of our experience, uh, uh, and it isn't necessarily so. In, places uh, in the south, but if you've got wind dust storms and dust comes in, you need to start worrying. Uh, we also talk a lot about energy management. 23 shows uh, natural ventilation as being a consideration. Now, natural ventilation has uh, been covered very well in slide 24 by the World Health Organization natural ventilation document in 2009. Uh, um, what this really, this, this uh, chart here is really telling us is that mechanical ventilation is really a, one of the only reliable ways of wor working with natural ventilation. Uh, um, TV, I believe, is easily taken care of with natural ventilation, uh, but there are some issues related to TV in a normal hospital and natural ventilation. Secluded units, secluded, uh, and the sanatoriums, uh, I think, work quite well, but by and large, infectious disease management really requires good mechanical ventilation or, in some exceptions, uh, uh, the use of, of natural ventilation. But uh, uh, those are few and far between when you think about the types of diseases that we have uh, moving around the world uh, uh, these days. And and uh, still being TB, being a big one, I just finished a large hospital in the Middle East where they had a lot of natural ventilation, but there we had problems with thermal barriers and condensation potential between natural ventilation and highly uh, ventilated areas. So uh, natural ventilation, while it's a consideration, uh, doesn't do well in extreme climates, uh, more along the equator, equatorial, uh, so we don't have, they don't have to worry so much about uh, the, the issues. So uh, something worth talking about, but in ventilation consideration 25, uh, energy efficiencies from displacement or chill beams or minimal leakage are really uh, things that are being addressed these days in, in, in an effort to, to deal with energy efficiency. We just finished the building a couple of years ago where we had a mix of, of uh, displacement air as well as uh, chill beams, as well as a normal ventilation in a ambulatory care uh, facility. And uh, one of the things that administrators, administrators wanted is to save money on energy because this building is not uh, continuously occupied. So cycling of fans 
can become reality. But then if you have a high-end pharmacy in there and, oh, my gosh, endoscope processing, and uh, you, you, you have to be very careful about how you, you deal with that. So uh, there are a lot of benefits to putting in uh, a chill beams. Uh, you see them there. We're not going to spend much time on it. Uh, but generally speaking, we have kept them out of uh, uh, clinical areas such as operating rooms or patient care areas. They we put them primarily in <coughs> clinic space uh, where uh, patients come and go <coughs> and uh, don't uh, have that much uh, infectious uh, uh, problem. So generally speaking, the, the ventilation is controlled separately and it's very difficult to get into. The, the nitty-gritty associated with it, but suffice it to say that in the next slide we see a building going up and the value of the chill beam is you get a good exterior wall, one that is painted in this case with an elastomeric uh, um, um, chemical that seals the wall to keep the humidity out, and we need to keep the humidity out in most instances. But if you want to save energy using chill beams, this is what you have to do, and it's a good thing because keeping that humidity out really reduces the infiltration of, of, of moisture and mold. Uh, the chill beams themselves in slide 28 are a little complex, but suffice it to say that they, they can save money. Uh, we need to be careful where we put them. They should not receive or feel any relative humidity above 30 to 40 percent because of potential condensation but yet these are some of the realities of, of energy management today and even though they've been around a while we don't have a lot of direct patient care environment using uh, chill beams or displacement ventilation which are uh, two money savers uh, in, in, the, in the world today. One of the things that we tried to do in our uh, new old hospital, uh, uh, slide 29, is uh, leak test. A common uh, uh, consideration for leak testing uh, and, and energy management is to seal a building, homes primarily. Uh, and uh, that's really a good thing uh, if you can do it because it will help control the ventilation to uh, minimize the leakage. Uh, that leakage uh, uh, is, deals with pressure, and buildings become pressurized. And if we don't have a good seal on, on the building, we don't have the control we want for our, our special ventilation rooms, and especially if the building goes negative and starts sucking moisture into a highly uh, uh, treated air uh, uh, environment. So a blower door like the one you see on slide 29 is really something that's used. Uh, for that kind of thing. We'll get into this a little more. But now when you think of the phases of construction in slide 30, we've got uh, um, what is our concept of the building? It's really good for infection prevention <clears throat> to be involved from concept on. Not to say so much, but to know what they're going to plan for and, and deal with. You come into pre-design and schematic. There's a narrative that goes into pre-design that's good to read. So the concept of the hospital becomes ingrained. The schematic starts putting some of the space relationships in. Design development gets the rooms and the equipment uh, idealized. Uh, the construction documents <clears throat> tell the contractor how to build, where to build, what to build. Construction implementation of the means and methods. It's good not to tell the con contractor how to do it. Uh, but to ask the contractor what they're going to do and then to assist them uh, 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 how to deal with that. I should say that a little differently, but yet uh, we don't want to tell them exactly what to do. We want them to tell them what they're doing, tell us what they're doing, and then go from there. And if they're well-trained, that's what you want. Uh, training is really important so they understand what we're trying to do in the hospital, uh, not only in the preparation with the building materials, uh, but also uh, uh, the dealing with the ventilation and the specifications, the function, the functionality of the building. And that's where the commissioning comes in. Did you get what you pay for? And the whole aspect of activating for occupancy it was an amazing, uh, amazing process to certify the building for use. Where infection control has been involved with the new construction is in the safety meetings. 
the safety meetings discuss the aspects of 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 the the building, uh, what they're doing while they're doing it. Uh, they work with the user groups. Uh, they develop construction methods that need developing on the spot, and, and infection prevention can be a primary player uh, for a lot of that. Unfortunately, there's a lot that doesn't pertain to them. So, a designated individual that shows up or an agenda. Uh, on new, new construction is really an important part. Next slide. Uh, we follow the American Institute of Architects, or now it's not that anymore, it's Facilities Guidelines Institute uh, for some of our, our design. As I stated earlier, this isn't a code, uh, this is more a standard of care. Uh, how big the room shall be, how many uh, um, oxygen outlets, vacuum outlets, uh, what the light lighting should be or where the ventilation should be placed that kind of consideration or show up in the guidelines for a variety of, of, of places and 40 some states use the guidelines and it's also well represented around the world as, as a model to follow <clears throat> of course britain and canada have got their own but yet uh, uh, we certainly uh, um, um, recognize this and i've been a part of this program until this last year I started in 93 or 94 working with the guidelines. The slide 32 deals with uh, 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 new construction, the planning and design. Uh, um, what we, the question we have, uh, not so much in, well, yes, definitely in renovation. What infection control training is needed for contractors, supervisors, and workers? Uh, generally, there's training available for supervisors, but not necessarily for workers. And I'm proud to say that I've been involved with uh, the Carpenters Union since the, uh, roughly 2000 in developing a training program through best practice in healthcare construction occupied facilities through the Carpenters Union in Las Vegas. Their ICRA programs are rolling out nationwide in America and through North America uh, uh, as well. And, and it gives the, the contractor worker the worker be the, the rank and file individuals, the concept. The supervisory staff generally get a higher level of training through ASHI. Uh, I've been a part of that uh, team for many, many years, but uh, really the carpenters uh, deal with uh, uh, Joe and, and Hank and uh, all the rest of the workers that show up and give them a sense of the importance of their job uh, in, in managing it, why it's not a good idea to throw debris in the walls and so forth. So uh, I highly recommend it, and it's free to uh, infection control practitioners and contractors, uh, as well as uh, hospital maintenance staff, and something that should be looked in, regardless where you live, uh, uh, in North America or uh, around the world. Uh, slide 34 just essentially says there's a lot to know in indoor and outdoor projects. Uh, um, certainly outdoor projects have a, run, uh, a variety of things and water damage being a very important aspect because we don't want our building wet before we occupy. Uh, um, water quality again is, a, is something that's important in both sides and, and it's really important to keep that water moving even though it becomes very expensive uh, uh, just to throw water away. but. Uh, we fill our pipes with water months and months before we occupy, so that stagnation helps build a biofilm, and, and that's something that should be addressed in construction uh, um, uh, aspect. Next slide just shows awareness by trade. Some of the things that uh, the various trades should should have some sense for uh, um, when working in the hospital, especially the water damage and mold discovery, they should inform so that the stuff can be cut out uh, uh, and removed. It, uh, uh, it's fairly easy to manage. Cleaning goes a long ways in controlling mold uh, debris that uh, shows up. Uh, and these guys, the various individuals that work in different kinds of disciplines, should have uh, some aspect of, of controlling uh, the environment uh, in the construction phase. Uh, the various rooms in slide 36, uh, uh, are, those are conceptual, uh, uh, but ones that are deal with the principles of negative pressure or positive pressure, depending on what you're trying to do. The air change rates uh, are the same. The pressure management uh, ideally could be uh, somewhere 200s or maybe 
uh, somewhere around five pascals, uh, but yet, uh, or greater, uh, but not too much because we don't want, uh, like some of countries have got 30 pascals pressure relationship, that's enough to suck the paint off the walls. And what's worse, if it's under negative pressure, it's enough to start capillary movement of water if, in fact, your uh, facade is not put together properly in the curtain wall. So uh, um, we really want to, to finesse a lot of our pressure management, uh, but very important, again, in slide 37, is that solution to pollution, the solution. The CDC document that we modified into a graphic that becomes a little more understandable, but when you've got different kinds of air changes per hour in the left-hand column, and how long, how many minutes it takes to get a 90% reduction in, in particles. Uh, with 12 air changes an hour, which is the standard for uh, airborne infection isolation rooms, it takes 12 minutes to get one, uh, to get a 90% reduction. So you can very effectively uh, uh, purge the environment uh, in 23 minutes uh, if you've got 12 air changes uh, per hour. To get up to the higher rates, you start reaching a point of diminishing returns, as you can see at the slope of the, of the um, same graphic there as it moves out. And we've stopped at somewhere between 15 and 20 uh, for operating rooms in, 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 in an effort, again, to not overdo it uh, in, in, to help with the energy management. Operating room ventilation, slide 38, uh, uh, is important for comfort control. State-of-the-art or long surgeries and fancy surgeries, uh, uh, we really want temperature and humidity to be correct so the surgeon uh, does not get stressed uh, in uh, due to heat or due to climate conditions in that operating room. Anesthetic gas management is really critical for those air change rates, even though we scavenge a lot. Uh, pediatric cases, it's tough. <laughs> it, it's tough. You have to sedate them, and that, that helps a lot. But yet, uh, uh, infectious disease control in operating room ventilation, uh, that really boils down to plume management, or, or if you're using the saw and, or eradicating a, a non-pulmonary uh, uh, tubercular lesion on, on, on somebody's back, spine. Uh, it's, it's a matter of controlling that locally, and scavenging systems are really very useful, as well as uh, uh, air change rates and directed ventilation. As you can see in 39, there are a variety of schemes for blowing air. Uh, it all depends on the occupant. Uh, the gadget itself doesn't do that much. It's containing uh, the shedder people in the operating room uh, and then blowing air in such a way that it's purged out. And one of the things we we are able to do is we are able to discover the age of air uh, and, and, and what, what uh, slide 40 tells you is the ideal blow the air straight down don't impede it with a bunch of false panels and overhead uh, utilities that uh, articulate in they should be off to the side and articulate in so the air can blow straight down with a, a velocity an air velocity of around uh, 30 feet per minute uh, over the surgical site, which allows for the air over the surgical site to be purged constantly. And as long as nobody's working up above, uh, uh, that's a really nice way of creating a laminar flow-like regime. Uh, um, and really what we're trying to do in slide 41 is really control the particle. Keep the particle moving. Uh, the longer the particle stays in that room, uh, the worse off that ventilation is. So the better the ventilation, the shorter the, the age of air. Uh, um, in other words, if we can move air out of the operating room uh, in the surgical site, and I'm not going to explain it, uh, the, the next slide uh, kind of explains it where we generate uh, an aerosol, in this case uh, a gas, and we monitor how long it takes to move across uh, the room. Uh, what we find is common sense approach. If you build operating rooms, you really should have space for the things you store in there. Uh, um, uh, what we find is that uh, if you move things in front of uh, the return vents, uh, um, you end up blocking the airflow. This is not rocket science. This is common sense. Uh, if you put things in front of those vents, it slows the air down and does not purge. And then the next slide, some of the things that uh, we did is uh, to put braces so that uh, the bags, the garbage bags, the garbage uh, don't 
uh, suck up against the return air uh, and the supply air. As you can see, you've got dead panels with lights and, and uh, 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 hanging from above as well as blocking that effective ventilation. So we, we want to avoid that as well as on slide 44, avoid stacking things in front of the return ducts. Uh, pay more attention to stuff that matters, like whether or not you're keeping your uh, cardiac patches on the floor or your uh, um, Da Vinci device with uh, the electrical protection pads uh, over the tops of the handles. I mean, I, that's just bad practice. Uh, so it's not ventilation in this case. The ventilation is there, but the staff doesn't understand how to use it. So whatever we can do to provide a, an, an efficacy of particle removement, which we see in slide 45, that's the bovi at work generating aerosol uh, and the ventilation, uh, uh, seeing the, uh, the, the aerosol with my particle counter and then purging it, uh, uh, mitigating it with that high air change rate. So. It doesn't hang around long, and, and, and certainly that's important, and that's the case in all ventilation aspects. If you generate an aerosol, we don't want it to hang around very long. That's why we promote those air changes per hour, which is very important to validate in new construction. Did we get what we paid for? Because this, is, this kind of a model should be something we see uh, all through uh, the life of that building. Controlling uh, infectious, airborne infectious agents in, in surgery, scavenging, uh, uh, again, shed organisms, we want to uh, uh, really make sure the air moves. Uh, we just want to avoid air handling deficiencies. Things. I'm looking on a case now in the, in the Midwest where uh, it looks like this brand new the fan uh, uh, got something wrong with one of the fan chambers, and it's got too much condensation in there and creating, creating mold uh, in the filter bank. So... We really have to be careful uh, with those air handler deficiencies, especially after new construction. Why, again, we need to make sure we do it right. And that's why in 47, we've got a functional performance testing for some critical areas, areas in this Chicagoland hospital. We wrote out all the critical rooms that needed some kind of assurance uh, from the type of room monitoring system, local displays, uh, do they have monitors, in other words, air changes per hour, differential pressure offset? Again, all things that are, are important, and, and we this becomes baseline information, especially with the leakage rate that they developed and the, the particle counts. Uh, this next slide, uh, barrier management, is something that uh, I worked with Hilti. I did get money, uh, but uh, one of the things we want to make sure people understand is that if you put up a good wall, uh, it can do many things from enhance infection control, reduce sound transmission for HIPAA reasons, to uh, assist us with energy uh, as well as uh, our, our life safety systems, uh, which again would be smoke management and fire management. But these are all things that, uh, that I believe I covered in a teleclass once before in energy management and healthcare. Uh, but things uh, that are, are very important, especially during the construction phase of the hospital. <clears throat> when you look at in the infection control aspects of, of um, barrier management, uh, it's controlling that aerosol and, and uh, uh, managing that leakage that makes the infection prevention aspects uh, successful. So uh, um, it's a, a part of the total system. And again, one of the things I really emphasize and heard it said here in this, these programs before is uh, is that uh, uh, um, if we do it right, we don't have the problems uh, that we uh, would, would normally have otherwise. So uh, especially if you're putting something together like an Ebola unit, this is a, uh, a uh, um, Ebola unit that was built in the Middle, Middle East, uh, um, one that they have pie in the sky airflow needs. Uh, they wanted to make sure the air was flowing in, in the proper direction. And when you translate that, the pressure is, wow, this becomes really, really tricky. Uh, they did an outstanding job. I've never seen it before in the United States where they seal the building this well. It's a 250-bed uh, infectious disease hospital uh, that's uh, um, in the epicenter of pandemic or epidemic uh, uh, outbreaks, MERS, and that sort of thing uh, in the recent past, and they certainly... Uh, we're serious because they lost so many patients during the first SARS uh, outbreak that occurred uh, in and around uh, 
uh, the Straits of Malacca, if you know where that is. Uh, so anyway, um, this is uh, something that really requires very good construction management methods uh, in order to assure the specifications are met. Uh, and uh, they did uh, remarkably well when we commissioned that some weeks ago uh, uh, in, in the Far East. Competencies for principal, competency, competency principles for hospital design to control certain infectious disease. Uh, we really want ventilation, uh, and, and that's the pressure intensity. That those are spec'd out. Uh, uh, air exchanges for dilution, filtration for cleanliness of that air for dilution, and then that clean to dirty airflow. We need to know that. Those are principles and competencies that that all construction workers should understand even though they read a print quite differently than the way that you and i uh, would read a blueprint surface management are, are the surfaces cleanable uh, durable and that really that really uh is is important uh, uh when it comes to uh um clean disinfection uh, we certainly want that to be part of the spec in, in, in building and then water quality assurance, flushing or disinfecting, old brother, that's a real tough one. We, we have uh, our buildings use uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water a day in some instances, and, and not all that water goes through pipes but just sits there uh, and stagnates. So that, that really is, is a, a big deal. Likewise, leakage. Uh, uh, if you get water leakage, uh, there are a number of devices that uh, we can use to assess the environment and get on it to dry it out. And that has to be part of construction because we don't want uh, wet building materials uh, uh, festering and growing mold. Uh, the thermal uh, the thermal infrared uh, camera on 54 uh, is an excellent tool. We're looking for these things. Uh, I've been in brand new buildings where you see color contrasts like you, you do here where cold is very close to hot red being hot and blue being cold, uh, you get condensation at those interfaces. And, and then you get the mold growing like you see in the picture. Uh, and that really is something you, a lot of times they discovered because they value engineered uh, the, uh, the insulation out of a southern building like uh, this came from. So uh, we don't want that. And, and, and it's a very important that uh, if we start seeing mold, what the reasons are, and it's usually too much moisture which is the case for leaky sinks, uh, um, lack of uh, caulking on the laminate sinks where they're put in, this is slide 55, improper uh, pop-off valves that uh, cause leaking of steam and growing mold, and we certainly need to be very careful about when that happens, and I've seen some very moldy hospitals under construction, especially if they, after they get smacked by El Nino or <clears throat> or Hugo, uh, um, big hurricane. So we, we really need to be aware of when things get wet that we can't allow that mold to grow and carry on. Monitoring becomes an issue in slide 56. How you do it, this method of, of uh, sticky slide impaction is, is common and is useful. It should be employed uh, in, in helping to commission. It should not be the sole reason for commissioning, uh, um, but yet... Uh, those are topics that require additional time. Air sampling interpretation, again, indoor-outdoor ratios. We certainly, when we collect samples, and a lot of times hospitals want to do that, uh, there's a, not every hospital should have it. We want pressure management and water quality, I think, for all hospitals. But yet uh, um, there are means and methods of, of air sampling and interpreting those Similarities with outside and inside aren't always good, but yet when, when the organisms are all the same, and this is by spore morphology, when they're all the same, they, they tend uh, uh, to have an indoor source, which really requires uh, uh, some investigative. Uh, sampling, surface sampling is extremely useful. Uh, um, we're looking for indoor problems, indoor controls, and, and, and we need... Uh, 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 plate control if we're looking at, at problem areas and certainly where we had in this new hospital we looked at in the last couple of weeks, uh, they had uh, uh, the ventilation system uh, that we checked out, which was seemed to be having a problem while all the rest of the building, which were almost exactly the same, did not and really allows a comparison, which we really need to do because 
you're either looking looking for poor maintenance or building a, a part defect or areas with previous water damage. And the methods we use are road acts uh, with surface contact media plates. Uh, swabs, uh, tease tape, which is very useful, or the vacuum method, well, which you just saw. Uh, again, I apologize for going through this so quickly. The particle counter on slide 59, the pressure gauge, and the air balancing hood are really very important aspects of, of validating that we got what we paid for in the ventilation from a ventilation point of view. And with energy management uh, being as aggressive as they are, trying to save. Uh, uh, dollars on uh, the square footage that they're ventilating. Uh, we really need to be very, very careful about this because uh, uh, infection control uh, should be involved with, with what they plan to do uh, and then help control it when they're doing it. So it's, it's an aspect. Going back to a slide that I showed previously, it's these numbers that we want to validate. Uh, in the FGI or whatever uh, whatever government document you may have at NHS or, uh, from, from the UK or the, the Canadian Standards Agency, uh, um, they, they all have numbers that we want to make sure uh, are validated uh, to make sure that uh, we got what we paid for in new construction. Uh, so the objectives for infection control during construction, again, uh, as we occupy the bay building, a new building, be respectful for patients. Uh, we still need to control aerosols regardless uh, if it's occupied or not, especially in the main, uh, maintaining the clean environment before we commission or, if you will, uh, to activate the building. Uh, uh, preventing water damage throughout, responding to water damage emergencies, Documentation, uh, uh, providing documentation and training and to, to communicate uh, are really essential aspects of, of our, our need to build uh, good sanitary hospitals. And uh, certainly uh, that happens in most instances and it's uh, improved a lot uh, in, in my tenure as uh, an infection preventionist here in, in these United States. So with that, I thank you uh, uh, for listening. Uh, I apologize for just way too much, uh, maybe a better systematic approach to uh, to dealing with new construction. But but there is there is a, a, a means by which I showed you in, in these uh, these slides and uh, one that you can go back to look over. And if you have questions, please don't call, uh, email me, and I'll be more than happy to assist you in any way that I can. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, um, I think I'm done two minutes early, so uh, I'll turn it back to Lynn and Paul uh, and see what they say we do next. Well, thank you, Andy, for a fantastic lecture. Um, it is comprehensive in scope and will be very, very useful for our listeners. Uh, they'll refer to it many times in the future. Uh, with that, let's go to the last two slides, um, number uh Oh, good heavens, it's 62 and 63, I think. Uh, the first of these is the um, calendar for the upcoming teleclasses in November. Um, there will be two free teleclasses uh, and two others. There is a topic for health-associated pneumonia, not ventilator-associated. That's a good one. The role of cleaners in infection prevention. Also, uh, behavioral infectious risk in acute care, that is part two of the series, and then antibiotic stewardship programs prioritizing research. Uh, hopefully these will be of interest to you. Now the final slide of our uh, program today is our patron sponsors acknowledgement. So we have three, Diversity, a company that provides a variety of services and products for infection prevention, Virox, well-known among uh, companies providing chemical disinfectants, and as always, the World Health Organization for all of their infection prevention services, education, and support. And with that, let's say a uh, good day to you all. Hope you have a wonderful and healthy rest of your day. See you at the next teleclass. Take care. Bye-bye.